<laughs> a warm welcome to all of you. Lovers of art, architecture, and New York City history who are gathered today to honor and celebrate the life and work of illustrator and painter Charles Dana Gibson. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein Spielvogel, the chair of the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center, a group of distinguished and dedicated individuals committed to informing the public about the past, present, and future of historic preservation in our city. Our special thanks to the Murray Hill Neighborhood Association, to Susan Demmitt and company, and most of all, to our gracious homeowners, Mr. and Mrs. Hockberg. Thank you very much for your hospitality and opening your home to us. We appreciate that. The Murray Hill Neighborhood Association is part of our new initiative to partner with neighborhoods and historic districts to enhance the, commem to enhance the commemoration of notable New Yorkers from diverse communities. Today we are here to celebrate and honor the work of Charles Dana Gibson, best known for his eponymous creation, The Gibson Girl. He displayed a precocious talent for the arts as a child, and by the age of 14, through family connections, was apprenticed to the renowned sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens. Gibson quickly realized that sculpture was not his strength and turned to pen and ink. Subsequently, he was enrolled by his parents in the Art Students League. But he left school in 1885 due to a downturn in the family fortunes and landed a job with Life Magazine, which at the time was a comic publication. He was paid a starting monthly salary of $33. His value to the magazine quickly grew apparent. By his third month there, he was making $185. By 1880, when he first started to draw the Gibson Girl, he had firmly established his career as one of the most popular American illustrators. He held that position for the next 30 years. Most scholars agree that the Gibson girl, his most famous creation, was based on his wife, Irene Langhorne Gibson, part of a very distinguished Virginia family. It was later reported in Life magazine, I'm going to quote, in her he found all he had idealized on paper, the Gibson girl. And this is a quote from the time. A glorification of white American womanhood provided, the, and this was the thinking at the time, us a perfect and particularly American image of femininity, athletic, intelligent, stylish, and desirable. Although Gibson continued to produce illustrations well into the 1920s, the apex of his popularity and that of the Gibson girl was between 1900 and 1910. During that time, her sales power and merchandising appeal was so great that although Gibson longed to leave commercial art to become an oil painter, his annual salary had reached the unheard of sum of $75,000 which was a fortune at the time. He simply could not afford to abandon pen and ink. <laughs> With the advent of World War I, Gibson, then serving as president of the Society of American, called then the Society of <coughs> Illustrators, convened a group of renowned illustrators, which eventually became the division of the pictorial publicity. They joined the United States Office of Public Information and worked to create some of the most powerful pro-war propaganda for this nation. However, when the war ended, 
the public turns its attention from the elegant Gibson girl to the rouge knees of flappers, besotted with jazz, fast cars, and gin. <laughs> Although Gibson continued his illustrative works and was in 1918 elected into the National Academy of Design, his popularity and that of his creation dimmed. By 1920, Gibson, leading a syndicate of illustrators, writers, and staff members, bought Life magazine at auction. He retired from the magazine in 1932, finally taking up the painting, oil painting, at the American Academy of Arts and Letters, who exhibited his paintings by 1934. And though he garnered glowing reviews from the New York Times, his work, his technique, and even the once ubiquitous Gibson girl were eventually forgotten. Gibson retired in 1936 to an 18-room house on 700-acre island off the coast of Maine, where he had summered for decades. In the fall of 1944, he suffered a heart attack and was, by the request of President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, transferred via Navy seaplane to New York City, where sadly he died a few weeks later. And now we have our program, people who have studied and written and lived with <laughs> the history of Charles Dana Gibson. Our first speaker is Dennis Dietrich. He began his career as an illustrator in 1982, and his clients, a very auspicious list of clients, include Sports Illustrated, Smithsonian, Field and Stream, Electra Records, Golden Books, Reader's Digest, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. I hope they're paying attention to you today. <laughs> <laughs> his work has been featured in American Artists in Print. He is a former president of the Society of Illustrators. Dietrich has also been on the New York Board of Directors of the Graphic Artists Guild. Currently, he is an associate professor and illustration coordinator at New Jersey City University. Dietrich also conducts the visual thesis creation class and serves as thesis advisor. Any of us who have lived through this know how critical that role is <laughs> at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Thank you for joining us, Dennis Dietrich. Thank you, Barbara Lee. After that, I hope they don't expect too much. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, uh, I could really edit this by saying, yeah, what she said. Uh, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of this material is the same. But uh, let's recap what you already know. We're honoring a man who was a fixture in the upper strata of New York society. On, at the, he was an A-lister for every, of every one of the most Tony events in New York, and in some sense, a war hero. This is a man who created the Gibson Girl, a female archetype whose weekly appearances, weekly magazine appearances, helped a young country establish a cultural identity apart from that of her European cousins, especially the English. He hated everything Anglophile. Is that right, Tara? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one of us is lying. <laughs> She appeared not only in the pages of Life magazine, but on spoons, wallpaper, umbrella stands, and scores of products in countless Victorian era homes. This is a man who used this position as the longest serving so uh, Society of Illustrators president. He did 12 years. Mm -hmm. I only did six. <laughs> Lazy. <laughs> uh, and uh, to create the Division of Pictorial Publicity, as we've just learned, as part of the Department of uh, Office of Public Information. He mustered the most popular illustrators in the country to work pro bono to aid the war effort, creating visual communications material. You know about that. That's why we're here. 
One of the things I wanted to talk about was the Charles Dana Gibson, the young Charles Dana Gibson, who drew so badly he couldn't get arrested. Uh, descended from an old New England family, not old money, just old. Uh, Gibson, uh, uh, the first contact with art came, see if I'm lying about this too, uh, with um, when his father cut out little silhouettes. Oh, wow. uh, to entertain. <laughs> He entertained him by cutting out little silhouettes of animals. Back then, you didn't have Grand Theft Auto to put Junior in front of <laughs> until he went to college. Your parents had to be a little more creative. So um, the, the boy was so intrigued by that that he began the activity himself. Uh, he had very high standards and only kept the ones that uh, met the bar, threw the rest away. After a while, he amassed quite an inventory, and along with his brother Langdon, <laughs> See, this is like giving a book report, and then the author shows up. <laughs> and like, I'm going to get C's. So, <laughs> no, you're doing B plus now. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, I, he amassed an inventory, went into business with Langdon and a girl down the street. They set up shop on the steps of the Gibson home, right? Okay. <laughs> yes. Hold up, look. Uh, they set up shop in the steps of the Gibson home, and like so many retail operations before Amazon, foot traffic was essential to, the, to success. Well, they didn't get a lot of foot traffic. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, their only customer was the milkman who bought one of their items and the business closed by lunchtime. He <laughs> uh, didn't exhibit an interest in drawing until later, and then, as Barbara Lee said, when he was high school age, he went to the Art Students League. Spent about two years at the league, uh, studying next to another guy that uh, made good, Frederick Remington. So, uh, after about two years at the league, he decided to help with family finances, enter the graphic arts business, and visited every art editor, every engraving house, and uh, every print shop in New York met with nothing but rejection for an entire year. And it was finally John Ames Mitchell at Life Magazine who describes Gibson's early drawings as reasonably bad, <laughs> uh, recognized uh, an underlying talent and chose to develop it. Gave him an assignment to illustrate Me on the Moon, a song from the Mikado. Uh, that was a popular song at the time. Gibson drew uh, a little dog <laughs> straining at his dog chain to get a better look at the moon. He was paid $4 in 1886. He spent 75 cents of it on a big chicken pie, as, a, as my research is correct. So it was only three years later that he was in demand by every one of the most popular publications in New York, reaching an income of some $800 a month. And that's before income taxes. It wasn't until a trip to Europe. Because he drew a lot like Thomas Nast. His cross hatchings were a little similar to that. But it wasn't until two years at the Academy Julien, or two, excuse me, two months at the Academy Julien in Paris that a, a makeover in his style emerged. And uh, that's what we recognize the very active, the very loose but tight, the very controlled but vibrant pen and ink execution that created the Gibson Girl. Okay, that's where we got that. Okay. Gibson enjoyed a social position that was not his birthright. He did not, he, he, he enjoyed a wealth he did not inherit and a celebrity that he built one drawing at a time. Living in this building from 1900 to 1902, Gibson reached the height of his fame. Never before had an artist had so much influence on American business and culture. The Society of Illustrators would like to thank the Landmarks Preservation Center for inviting us to honor our most, her, our most celebrated member, who, apart from being a national treasure, according to our records, always paid his dues on time. <laughs> <laughs> We're all still happy about that. Congratulations on your choice. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and now, a truly informed voice, Professor Martha Patterson. She is the professor of English 
McHenry University and comes to us today from Illinois. All thanks to you and your university who sent you. Martha Patterson has written extensively on Gibson, on the American New Woman, and on the representation of women in popular media. Her book, Beyond the Gibson Girl, Reimagining the American New Woman, 1893 to 1915, was published about a decade ago and then issued in paperback. She received her master's degree in literary studies and doctorate in English from the University of Iowa, well known for its creative writing facilities. Dr. Patterson was a Fulbright lecturer and scholar and is currently at work on a book on major themes that she may choose to tell you about. But I hope you will tell us your evaluation, your scholarly evaluation of the life and work of Charles Stanley Gibson. Welcome, Professor Patterson. Thank you all. I'm delighted to be here, uh, especially because my uh, dissertation, um, all my work really started with uh, Gibson and uh, his, and I can still remember paging through, uh, paging through volumes and volumes of popular magazines from the turn of the 19th into the 20th century at the University of Iowa and I came across his work and I was so struck by it and it, and it, um, it started uh, work that I would continue on for years after that. Tall, distant, elegant, and white with a perched nose, voluminous upswept hair, corseted waist, and large bust. Charles Dana Gibson's pen and ink drawings of the American girl, the Gibson girl, offered the most popular version of the new woman, a term used to describe women who sought greater self-determination and political power at the, at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. Given that the dominant image of the new woman was as a suffragette, and that she was most often depicted negatively in the popular press as unattractive, barren, neglectful, and manly, doomed to the rank of spinster, shrewish wife, neglectful mother, or housekeeper, Gibson's work offered women activists an important tool to counter those images. On the one hand, however, Gibson satirized suffragettes as manly and overbearing. In a suffragette's husband, for example, from 1911, Gibson depicted a bespectacled, double-chinned woman casting a stern gaze on her beleaguered, resigned husband whose dog sits by uh, in mute sympathy. <laughs> on the other hand, however, his images of the American girl seen everywhere in the pages of popular magazines, calendars, decorative plates, World War I recruiting posters, and books promoted a measure of women's personal independence, self-actualization, and sexual assertiveness. Most often, the Gibson girl represented the modern ideal of the right to exert one's personal preference, especially in selecting a mate. In an article for the Atlantic Monthly, uh, written in 1901, Caroline Tickner envisions a meeting between the mid-19th century ideal of feminine beauty, the steel engraving lady, and the modern Gibson girl. Ensconced in domestic and spiritual bliss, the Victorian steel engraving lady eagerly awaits the return of her adoring husband when the Gibson girl bursts in. The two types debate their respective virtues, the Gibson girl proclaiming, quote, we are so imbued with modern thought that we have done away with all the oversensitiveness and overwhelming modesty in which you are enveloped. We have regressed in every way. When a man approaches, we do not tremble and droop our eyelids, or gaze adoringly while he lays down the law. We meet him on the ground of perfect fellowship. Indeed, Gibson presented women as dominating the mating game, and less frequently smoking, <coughs> drinking, swimming, golfing, or posing as college girls and jurors. In Girls Will Be Girls from, 19, from 1897, for example, a group of Gibson girls casually smoke and drink after a day of horseback riding and golfing. <laughs> the ball club strewn about them and pictures of a boxing match and a bulldog behind them, the Gibson girl seems little concerned with having entered a male domain. 
Charlotte Perkins Gilman, the most prominent feminist writer of the period, in fact lauded the Gibson Girl as a new woman representing women's legal, social, mental, and physical progress, a symbol of their growing freedom from being economically dependent on men. The tremendous proliferation and appeal of her image and the bevy of imitations her success sparked makes the Gibson Girl the most influential version of the popularizing woman. And even though her image celebrated an Anglo-Saxon affluent model of American beauty, women of different class, regional, ethnic, and racial backgrounds would appropriate her image to sanction their own efforts for social change. With at least some of the trappings of Gibson Girl look, of a Gibson Girl look, women of color, regardless of national origin, could demonstrate their amenability to assimilation and their consequent right to the franchise and social esteem. African American women, including Margaret Murray Washington, Booker T. Washington's wife, adopted her image to suggest that the legacy of slavery in no way permanently affected the progress of her race. The rise of the flapper in the late teens and 20s seemed to signal the, the Gibson girl's fading cultural authority and the end of an era. The power of her archetype in feminine, of feminine beauty remains, however, as any visit down the Barbie doll aisle of a department store can <laughs> <in the> test. <laughs> Professor Patterson, and thank you for reassuring us. Um, she, the Gibson girl sounds like an early proponent of the She Too movement. <laughs> <laughs> and now, a member of the family. Um, Mr. Dietrich described an earlier, more stratified social system that is not part of this organization's view of the human condition. In Virginia, there was indeed a very rigorous social stratification where the beautiful wife of Charles Dana Gibson came from. And she did come from an auspicious family. And as I recall, one of her sisters, Lady Nancy Astor, was the first woman to enter Parliament, so he must have gotten over his anti-Anglophilia. <laughs> Sarah Gibson Wiley is an interior designer who uses her artist's eye and her DNA <laughs> to be inspired and find her own business. She creates her own works of art that was launched in 2012. Her firm, U Huber? UG. UG. Sorry? UG, like two letters. It's you, Charles. UG, Charles. <laughs> UG brings to life events and stories in an original art form. Her mother is an artist, her grandmother is a sculptor, and her sister Dana Gibson is a decorative artist who enjoys national renown. Her great grandfather, as you know by now, was Charles Dana Gibson. She has brought her own illustrations of his work and her own family stories to reinforce his role in American culture. A very warm welcome. We're very pleased you're here with us today. Well, I'm here. My dad should be here. He's the historian of the family, and he wrote this book, which is about my great-grandmother, Irene Langer Gibson who married, as we know, Charles Dana Gibson. So he published it himself, so you probably will find it in every bookstore. But. <laughs> um, I didn't know my great-grandfather, obviously. He died when my dad was three. But both my dad and my great-grandfather are and were great storytellers, so I rely on that information. Um, my dad would be here, except for he has cancer, unfortunately, and it's a little too weak to make the trip. Um, he worked in the bond business, but then retired and wrote several historical books. One he wrote about was his great-grandmother, Irene Langer Gibson, Dana's wife. And do, I don't know, he was called Dana, so I'm going to refer to him as Dana. Um, so a lot of fun family stories are included in this book. Coming up in the train yesterday is re read, read a lot of his um, writing, especially the part on Dana. So. Uh, Feel like when you talked about information, I was very familiar with it. <laughs> I just read it yesterday. <laughs> um, 
let's see, so but when I spoke to my dad and said, Dad, what should I say? He said he wanted to pass along just what a nice and kind man his great his grandfather was. Dad said, not like your typical artist, quote. And I'm not sure what he meant by that. I'm an artist, my sister and my mother, so I don't know what that means. But while re reading this book, I came across a little story that he wrote, and it was about his dad, um, th the two of them, my dad and his dad, went to the movies, The Girl in the Red Velvet Swing, oh, yeah. Yeah. which was um, the story surrounded a love triangle, which included Stanford White, and he's an architect who, um, the corner. right around the corner, um, <laughs> yeah. Madison Square Garden, yeah. Well, we also built the... Uh, Okay, well he's an architect. He was a friend of my great grandfather's and my grandfather's godfather. So this is why I'm sure that which is movie. Um, the story went that um, in the movie Dana was portrayed as an artist and the actor was wearing a shiny light blue suit mm -hmm. and, and a fet feminine, artist smock, and a large red bow tie. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was horrified, <laughs> <laughs> says my dad in the story. <laughs> Evidently, Dana would not be caught dead in these clothes or even a smock. He painted, and you see it in the pictures, in a suit and coat and tie, and um, he had the big white collars that came up and covered his face. Nothing at all what you picture in this movie. He was a gentleman. He was warm and strong, a sensitive and loving man. He adored his children and grandchildren. Those are words from my grandfather, who I didn't know. Um, okay, so my dad's book um, about my great-grandmother was very interesting for me to read. Um, women back then in Virginia, which is where she grew up in Richmond, were auctioned off as if they were cows to the men. <laughs> and I mean, I just, that just, I can't believe that it used to be like that. In the South, probably not up here, but in the South. Well, it was um, the dowry that he had in mind. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, and his father, my grand, great grandmother's father wanted her to marry rich, and Dana was not your typical rich person. Artists are not expected to be rich. Um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, the story goes that my great grandmother had 67 marriage proposals. She was quite beautiful and was the belle of all, a real southern belle. So um, they were at a restaurant, Delmonico's, I think. Is yes. that up here? Yes. yes. Okay. It still is. Huh? It still, it still is. is. Okay. So um, Dana was there and she knew who he was, but um, she saw she saw he was sitting at a table. Um, with somebody that she knew, Russell, I think his name was. She walked to the bathroom, back and forth, three or four times, <laughs> with her skirt swishing to make noise, before finally her friend noticed her and, and made the introduction. So, um, and as I said, um, her father wanted to marry someone with money. Um, very disappointed that he was an artist and didn't have a very promising salary. And it also sounded like she could marry anyone, so why she went with him, except that he was very sweet and she was kind of socialite and butterfly all over the place. So um, Their wedding was in Richmond at the Jefferson Hotel, which is a um, big hotel, um, still there, very fine and fancy. And I've always heard this, and of course it's written in the book, that they finished the uh, they rushed to finish the um, hotel in order for the wedding party to stay at the Jefferson Hotel. And so when I was 24 and got married the first time, I had all my out-of-town guests stay there because I thought that was a special little family place. Um, and after their wedding, the Richmond Papers front page was all about their nuptials, the headline saying, Beauty and Genius, one of the most brilliant weddings in our city's history. Um, and then uh, Maine was mentioned, and he had a um, he built he had a house um, on 700 Acre Island, which is a little island off Islesboro, which is off Camden, Maine, and I've been there. Um, but we all know about his creative talents from cutouts as a boy to pen and inks that funded his career, and finally oil paintings that he enjoyed later in life. 
But you, did you know that on this small island in Maine, that he built his own, with his own hands, a stone chapel with a turret, mm -hmm. still there, mm -hmm. and a stone playhouse for his grandchildren. And I remember going up there to visit as a child. My great aunt lived there, my grandfather's sister. And so it's actually still in the family. But we would, it's been divided, but <laughs> it's still there. Um, and I played in the little two-room playhouse with my sister. And then we went up there about seven years ago. My youngest sister um, put together a um, birthday party for my dad's 70th, and we all went up there. And my sister had her baby boy, who's my god son, and his name is Gibson, and he was christened in the little chapel. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of neat. Um, but it's been an honor to be part of this cultural medallion ceremony. Thank you for including me. Um, and I thank everybody for recognizing my great-grandfather. I wish I knew him. <laughs> description of life among the Charles Dana Gibson family. <laughs> Thank you. Let's talk for a moment about cultural medallions. We're about to unveil one on this beautiful house. <laughs> cultural medallions of personalized enamel plaques. They are affixed to the exterior of buildings throughout New York City to commemorate an individual or an occurrence that has made a significant contribution to New York City's rich cultural heritage and to create a sense of pride in our history. Most of the people or events are nominated for inclusion by members of the public, which I am now encouraging you to do. But if you have verifiable information, no George Washington slept here, <laughs> and know of an individual who's made a contribution, a remarkable contribution, and know where they resided in a building that still exists, no phantom sites, please let us know. And if you would like to learn more about our programs, please see our website, HLPC www.hlpcculturalmedallions.org And please watch this videotape when it comes out very soon. So there are approximately, the program is based on the programs that exist throughout the world. And since, like most New Yorkers, born or adopted, we have a very uh, narrow and chauvinistic view of that, that the best of the best either lived or were born here and helped create the culture <laughs> as we view ourselves as the cultural capital of the nation and on more expansive days of the world. <laughs> so uh, please let us know about anyone you think is appropriate. It most closely resembles the Blue Marker program in England uh, that is started by English Heritage in 1860 and with the force of all of that great sense of history of that country, worthy history, much of it, um, there are now 900 cultural medallions throughout all of England since 1860. We mighty few at the Historic Landmarks Preservation Center have, in the last 18 years, initiated 115 cultural medallions throughout the five boroughs. We particularly look for your assistance in those boroughs that are less represented, not as well represented as Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. Um, so while you're thinking, please pay some particular attention to the diverse communities that have done so much to enrich our life and style in New York. 
Uh, and now uh, we are going to go outside in the rain. I think it is raining. I flinched before. Bobber. I thought it was snowing, <laughs> which is like uh, So I'm going to ask Deborah Burchard, the executive director of HLPC, to unveil the plaque, and Sarah Gibson Wiley to read it. We will give you a page so that you can study your lines. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to thank especially our hosts again, Mr. and Mrs. Hochberg. Thank you for your hospitality. Susan Demet, where are you? And company, um, who have done such a remarkable job. In fact, what is so wonderful about New York is its collaboration. In fact, there, there are now 141 historic districts containing more than 300,000 properties, and they've made a very visible difference. If you drive around any part of our city, you will see that every part is now, nearly every part, is a very worthy place to live, in large part because of historic district activism, because of homeowner participation. So thank the two of you. Thank the Mary Hill Neighborhood Association. And thanks to each, of, each and all of you for joining us here today. And now Susan Demick, the chair of the Mary Hill Neighborhood Association, who will help bring this program forward. And Sarah Gibson Wiley, Susan will unveil the Sarah, read the text. Thank you. Oh. Oh. Charles Dana Gibson, born September 14, 1867, died December 23, 1944, 111 East 35th Street, Manhattan. Best known for his creation, The Gibson Girl, who appeared in songs, operettas, clothing lines, hairstyles, even wallpaper designs, Charles Dana Gibson is generally credited for popularizing the ideal feminine beauty in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He studied for two years in the Art Students League and first sold his work in 1886 to the sat satirical Life magazine. For the next 30 years as America's most popular illustrator, his pen and ink drawings were featured in best-selling books such as Richard Harding Davis's Soldiers and Fortune and widely circulated magazines such as Harper's Weekly, Scribner's, and Collier's. He lived here from 1900 to 1902. In 1917, while president of the Society of Illustrators, Gibson gathered a group of artists to design posters to support the war effort, which became the division of pictorial publicity. In 1918, elected to the National Academy of Design, he briefly became editor and then owner of Life Magazine. In 1932, he retired from Life Magazine and moved to Maine, where he had summered since 1902 to paint.